Although the cells of our body can use all sorts of different types of signal transduction pathways to initiate cellular processes that ultimately create some type of physiological effect, all these signal transduction pathways have four important properties in common. They share four important principles. And to demonstrate what those principles are, I'd like to focus in on the four different types of pathways that we discussed so far. So in our discussions, we discussed epinephrine signaling, insulin signaling, EGF signaling, and we also looked at the phosphonosatide cascade. So what exactly are the four factors that these four pathways actually have in common. Well, fact number one is they all use protein kinases. Fact number two is they all use secondary messenger molecules. Fact number three is, or property number three is, they all depend on specific interactions between proteins and other molecules to basically stimulate that process. And number four is they all have to be terminated once they are actually complete, once they carry out their specific type of physiological effect. So to demonstrate why this is actually true, let's take a look and summarize the four different pathways that we discussed so far. And let's begin by discussing what types of protein kinases are used by the four different types of pathways that we discussed up to this point. So let's begin with the epinephrine signaling pathway. So remember, uh, in our discussion of the epinephrine signaling pathway, we focused on the physiological effect of running away from an animal, we said a bear. And so we said that a kinase is used in this particular pathway, namely protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is activated by a secondary messenger molecule that we'll talk about in a moment, cyclic A and P. And once the protein kinase A is activated, it goes on to activate effector molecules, for instance, enzymes, which carry out the breakdown of gly uh, uh, glycogen into glucose. And then the glucose can be used by these, let's say, skeletal muscle cells to basically produce ATP molecules, which themselves are used to basically contract the skeletal muscle. And once the skeletal muscle contracts, that is precisely what allows us to basically run away from that animal, from that bear, so carry out that particular type of physiological effect. Now, what about the phosphonosatide cascade? What types of kinases are used in this case? Well, in our discussion, we focused on two different types of kinases. We discussed protein kinase C and calmodulin, so cam-dependent protein kinases. And we said in this particular cascade, and we use the physiological effect of decreasing or increasing blood pressure, we said that these two types of kinases are basically crucial for allowing that smooth muscle in the cardiovascular system to actually contract. And so what these do is they stimulate the breakdown of glycogen and they stimulate the contraction of those smooth muscles, which also depend on ATP to basically contract. <clears throat> now, in the case of insulin signaling, we said that insulin signaling is basically used once we ingest a carbohydrate-rich meal. So once we ingest all these carbohydrates, the glucose concentration in our blood plasma increases, and we want to use the insulin signaling pathway to basically allow the uptake of the glucose into the cells and then allow the transformation of glucose into glycogen. And so that's exactly what insulin signaling pathway actually does. And to accomplish this, we basically use four important types of kinases. So the receptor itself that binds insulin actually contains a tyrosine protein kinase that is needed to initiate this entire process. Then we have a lipid kinase that is necessary to basically transform PIP2 into PIP3. And that lipid kinase is known as phosphoinositide 3 kinase. Then we have the PIP3 dependent protein kinase, which is used to basically activate protein kinase B, also known as AKT. And what protein kinase B does is it basically stimulates the movement of glucose transporters into the membrane of our cells, for instance, skeletal muscle cells. And then these skeletal muscle cells can essentially uh, uptake the glucose molecules and transform the glucose molecules into glycogen as a result of the activity of these protein kinases. 
Now, in the EGF signaling pathway, we discussed four different types of protein kinases. So just like in the case of insulin, here, the EGF receptor also contains a tyrosine protein kinase that is needed to actually initiate that signaling pathway. And then we also examined three other examples of kinases. So we spoke about RAFs, which were actually needed to activate MEX, and then the MEX are needed to activate ERKs. And these ERKs are protein kinases that move into the cell, into the nucleus of our cell, and inside the nucleus, they essentially activate these transcription factors, which uh, increase the rate of expression of genes, and that ultimately allows the cell to produce many proteins that ultimately allow the cell to grow and divide, which is what the physiological effect is in this particular case. So when we spoke about this pathway, we said that the physiological effect might be, for instance, actually sealing off that cut that we might experience on the epidermal cells of our skin. So we see that protein kinases are used by all four pathways that we discussed, and this implies that they play a crucial role in this signal transduction pathway in actually carrying out that particular type of physiological effect. Now, secondary messengers are also used by each one of these four different types of pathways, and we said that all these signal pathways use these, uh, these secondary messengers to basically amplify that initial signal. So these secondary messengers are intracellular agents, they could be molecules or ions, whose concentration can be greatly amplified, thereby amplifying the overall signal that was initially uh, taken up by that cell. So these secondary messengers typically act on proteins or enzymes that play crucial roles in the signal transduction pathways. And so in our discussion, these are the secondary messengers that we discussed, um, uh, except in this particular case, we actually didn't discuss how calcium or cyclic AMP is used by this pathway. So let's begin by epin uh, with epinephrine signaling. So in epinephrine signaling, we said that once a specific protein, the G-alpha protein binds onto adenylate cyclase, it stimulates adenylate cyclase to transform ATP into CAMP. And CAMP is that secondary messenger used by the epinephrine signaling. What it does is it binds onto protein kinase A and it activates protein kinase A. Now, for the case of the phosphonosatide, so that's actually spelled incorrectly, but let's imagine that's phosphonosatide cascade, we discussed three different types of secondary messenger molecules. So we looked at IP3, we looked at DAG, and we also looked at calcium. So we said that IP3 has to bind onto a calcium channel in the ER membrane to allow the calcium to move into the cytoplasm. And then the calcium, with the help of DAG, must bind onto a special protein we call protein kinase C. And that activates protein kinase C. On top of that, calcium also actually goes on to bind to calmodulin to form the calcium calmodulin complex, which then, which then goes on to activate those calmodulin dependent protein kinases. In the case of insulin signaling, we discussed how for the PIP3 dependent protein to actually begin to, to actually be able to activate protein kinase B, that PIP3 dependent protein kinase must actually bind PIP3. And the PIP3 itself is actually produced by the phosphonosatide 3 kinase. Now, in our discussion of EGF signaling, we actually did not examine these two secondary messengers, but these are in fact secondary messengers that stimulate the EGF signaling pathway, so calcium as well as cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Now, let's move on to property number three that all these four have in common, and that's the fact that all of these different pathways depend on the correct interaction between protein molecules and other molecules in that pathway. So, within any signal transduction pathway, proteins interact with other molecules. These other molecules can be proteins, or they can be lipids, or they can be secondary master molecules, such as the calcium ions, and these interactions basically stimulate and pass down the information needed to ultimately, to ultimately 
to ultimately stimulate the cellular processes that lead to some particular type of physiological effect. So in a case of this pathway, physiological effect might be running away. In a case of this pathway, so we might regulate the blood pressure. In this pathway, we actually want to uptake that glucose and transform the glucose into glycogen. In this pathway, we actually want to repair certain types of damages to the epidermal cells or the epithelial cells. Now, many of these pathways have different types of interaction. So, in this particular case, I've listed a single interaction that exists in each one of these pathways. So, in the case of epinephrine, we said that the activated G alpha protein must go on and bind to adenylate cyclase to actually transform those ATP molecules into cyclic AMP molecules, which then go on and activate protein kinase C. So, in epinephrine signaling, the alpha G protein must interact with adenylate cyclase for that um, pathway to actually continue. In the case of the phosphonosatide cascade, we saw that the IP3 has to bind onto a specific ligand-gated calcium ion channel on the ER membrane to actually allow the movement of the calcium from the ER lumen and into the cytoplasm. And only then can protein kinase C um, and the calmodulin-dependent protein kinase actually be activated. Now, in the case of insulin signaling, we said that the IRS1 must bind onto that insulin receptor to actually act as an adapter protein to allow the attachment of the phosphonosatide 3 kinase, that specific type of lipid kinase that is needed to actually transform the PIP2 into the PIP3 molecule that we mentioned right over here. And finally, in the EGF signaling pathway, we said that the GRB2 must be able to bind and attach onto that EGF receptor to actually act as the adapter protein and allow the attachment of the SOS. And only then can the SOS actually activate that RAS protein, which goes on to activate RAF, which then goes on to activate the MEX and the ERX and so forth. So interactions play very, very important roles in these signal transduction pathways. And finally, we have termination. So all these pathways, even though they're very important in actually carrying out some type of physiological effect, they must be regulated and controlled correctly because if they are not regulated, if they are not regulated and controlled correctly, if they're not shut down at the proper times, they can cause damage to our body. And as we'll see in the next lecture, they can actually lead to cancer. Now, what are, what are some common ways by which these pathways are actually shut down? Well, one way is for the primary messenger to actually dissociate from the side of that particular receptor. And we examined this particular method when we discussed epinephrine signaling. So epinephrine can actually dissociate from its side and that can basically stop that process from taking place. We also discussed the fact that G protein, so in the case of epinephrine signaling and also in the case of the EGF signaling, there are G proteins that contain GPase activity. And what that means is they actually have a built-in timer that allows it to deactivate the process after some time has passed. And we also discussed phosphatases. So Many of these pathways, actually all the pathways, depend on protein kinases. Now, the protein kinases actually activate molecules by phosphorylation. And to reverse this process, to deactivate that target molecule by removing that phosphoryl group, we depend on phosphatases to carry out that process. So we see that these are the three common mechanisms that are used by these different signal transduction pathways to basically terminate or turn off the activity of that signal transduction pathway.